I'd like to quickly play a, a short video, if we could. COVID-19 is targeted to attack uh, Caucasians and, uh, and, uh, and uh, black people. The people who are most immune are Ashkenazi Jews and, uh, and Chinese. A simple question for you as an early victim of COVID. I actually got it uh, March 10th, 2020. And, and my question to you is whether you think I should be worried about my genetics as an Ashkenazi Jew because I did contract COVID. No, not at all. And that statement that you saw there is a truncated version of a larger statement. No, I understand. You, you issued a, a clarification. Where I was I describing... It, I, I, was I understand. Descri Hold on. I, just, I had a I was simple describing question. You're now going study. on. I'm reclaiming my time. You don't have any uh, transcriptions of their interviews? We have the first one, and we have the dozens who come and talk to our office. Uh, they talk to your office privately? They talk to Republican staff, right. And they're not transcribed? No notes? No nothing? The first one happened Tuesday. No, no, I'm not talking about the first one. The first one, one happened Tuesday. Dozens. The next one happens tomorrow. The third one happens next Wednesday. And we'll continue to do that. You just said dozens. An FBI whistleblower, another FBI whistleblower, another FBI whistleblower, another FBI whistleblower, an FBI whistleblower, another FBI whistleblower, another FBI whistleblower, dozens and dozens of whistleblowers. Well, we're doing it the way we're supposed to do it, Mr. Goldman. No, you're supposed to turn it over to the minority. When they, when they, when they come and testify, you'll, you'll have access to the transcript like everyone on the committee will. You mean your staff is not going to turn it over to our staff? We're just in the dark? Okay. So you're saying right here, right now, that you did not support the family separation policy. That was not is your that question. your testimony? That was not your question. I'm asking it right now. Is that your testimony? We implemented a number of policies in the administration. I agreed with President Trump when he ended zero tolerance in June, June I believe, of 2018. Did you Absolutely. support the family separation policy? Again, we had, no, we had no family separation policy at the department. Really? Mr. Bensman, I also pulled just a couple of headlines in preparation for the hearing today uh, from uh, cases uh, that have occurred this year. January 23rd, teenager arrested in rape and murder of autistic Maryland woman was illegal immigrant and known MS-13 member. March the 7th of 2023, undocumented immigrant indicted on 11 counts of capital murder and abuse of a corpse that occurred in Montgomery, Alabama. June 2nd of 2023, five undocumented immigrants with ties to MS-13 charged with murder of Frederick Teen. I appreciate my colleague from Mississippi pointing out uh, four incidents, uh, the four articles that he cited of really terrible crimes uh, that happened to be committed by people who were not here lawfully. But I don't see you giving us any headlines about the more than 400 random mass shootings that we have had in this country. And why are we talking about isolated incidents that you have to point out from six months ago when we have two mass shootings every day in this country. Joe Biden is the definition of dark money. How much money did his family get paid off and how are his bills paid? Joe Biden got bribed and it was to the tune of millions and millions of dollars and the left wants to normalize the <laughs> of bribery. Like I just cannot get over the fact that we're gonna normalize this and we're calling Joe Biden's bribery, quote, a specific topic. No, it's bribery, it's money laundering, it's prostitution rings, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist for putting these theories out there. I wanna respond to uh, my friend and colleague from South Carolina and some of her allegations and statements that she made uh, about this so-called impeachment inquiry. I believe that she stated that Joe Biden got bribes, committed money laundering, and engaged in a prostitution ring. She says there are texts, emails, and phone calls. But then she says that we should trust the evidence itself. And with that, I agree, because the evidence itself shows absolutely no connection between Joe Biden and any of those allegations. So, we are now entering into what is so-called an impeachment inquiry, ostensibly because the Republicans say they need more information and that somehow 
by the Speaker of the House unilaterally declaring an investigation, an impeachment inquiry, that changes this committee's authority. It does not. You said in 2019 that impeachment requires a clear criminal act. Is that right? No. In fact, in the Trump impeachment, I said repeatedly, you can, you can impeach someone for non-criminal conduct. What I said then, I'm saying now, which is I strongly encourage you to look at criminal yeah. acts. All right. Is well, it? that testimony is there. But, but can let's I, can just, I, no, you can't, because I have 10 seconds left. New Yorkers from Queens and Nassau counties deserve better than George Santos, a total fraud and serial liar representing them in Congress. Mr. Santos's behavior has shown a consistent disregard for the principles of bipartisanship, servant leadership, good governance, and civil discourse. He has shown no interest in being a serious member of this chamber or to do the people's work. Let's raise the bar here in the House of Representatives. Let's hold one of our own accountable. Let's expel George Santos. I agree with everything that my Republican colleagues have said here today. But everything they have said here today was also true in May when they voted to protect George Santos. Has there been anything that has changed? Is it because we are learning revelations of connections between Mr. Santos and our other Republican colleagues from New York serving in this body? Maybe. But there is certainly one thing we know that is motivating this change of heart the 2024 election. However, the past couple of weeks, <clears throat> since October 7th, I have met with numerous families of hostages in Gaza who are searching for any information about their loved ones held in captivity. This is Abigail. Now, Abigail somehow got away and ran to Abichai's home, where she was also kidnapped with Abichai's wife and three children. And they all remain in captivity, at least we hope. Now, I've had the opportunity to meet a couple of times over the past few weeks with Elizabeth Naftali, Smadar's aunt and Abigail's great aunt. She is absolutely devastated with grief, fear, and worry about her little niece, Abigail. But what did the committee Republicans do last week with Ms. Naftali? They did not reach out to her to see how Congress could be of assistance to her as she grieves and waits for information about Abigail. No. Instead, the majority subpoenaed her. That's right. The chairman used the awesome power and authority of the United States Congress to target Ms. Naftali as part of his fishing expedition against Hunter Biden, allegedly because Ms. Naftali may have bought some art. There was a migrant that came into New York City that in his first 45 days in New York was arrested six times on 14 different charges. But there was no charges because the great district attorney, one that my colleague from New York, Mr. Goldman, has supported, the district attorney, Alvin Bragg, declined prosecution. Chairman, I appreciate that my colleague uh, from the 4th District of New York, which does not include any part of New York City, has spent time as a NYPD detective and is now an expert on our border policy and the history of it as he leaves this room. Do you think it would be problematic if X leaves up terrorist violence and propaganda in violation of the terms of service? Terrorist violence or terrorist prop propaganda? If it violates their terms of service, is it, is it problematic? Well, it depends on what the content is, but um, you know, they're a private company. They can do what they want with the content. Aha! They're a private company and they can do what they want with the content. Do you think it's problematic that X would profit off of terrorist violent, violence uh, propaganda and content on their social media platform? Well, first of all, just to go back to no, the- No, no, just answer the question. I don't have time. Do you think it's a pro problem if, they're, if they profit off of it? Well, if, they, if the company makes money doing what it does, I don't, I don't necessarily see a problem with that. Okay, interesting. Um, so let me just move on because you the, said the, the, the biggest concern, between, sir, I'm sorry, you said the biggest concern that you had from the Twitter files was the systematic flags for social media companies. Now, the Stanford EIP that you're talking about, I'm sure you are aware, uh, has documented that the social media platforms to whom they flagged potentially problematic tweets 
took action on only 35% of them, and only 13% of them were removed. Mr. Schellenberger, you said the biggest problem, and, and let me just ask you, Mr. Tybee, real briefly, you would agree that these flags, that the systematic flags that you saw were flags for a violation of the terms of service of the social media company, is that right? Sometimes, but sometimes in the case of uh, the instances like Congressman Massey, they were actually true information. I under, well, that, that may be the case, but the flag was for a violation of the terms of service. It's for their interpretation of a, of a violation. The, and then the social media company has to determine whether or not it, was, it is actually a violation of their terms of service. And in 87% of those flags, they were not removed. Last session, the Democrats made a mockery of impeachment, and we cannot allow them to become our teachers. Shrill voices should be kept far from this inquiry, lest they undermine its legitimacy and credibility. Congress has an obligation to approach serious accusations seriously. The Democrats would have us simply turn a blind eye to mounting evidence of a family influence peddling scheme that implicates the president. This we cannot do. We owe it to the country to get to the bottom of these allegations, and that requires the House to objectively invoke its full investigatory powers, respect the due process rights of all involved, and lay all of the facts before the American people. The Republicans have already spent 12 months on this exact investigation. They have obtained more than 100,000 documents, pages of documents, and dozens and dozens of hours of witness testimony. But there is not simply not a shred of evidence proving any wrongdoing by President Biden related to his son or otherwise. Uh, I want to focus on, uh, go back to what my colleague, Mr. Swalwa, was focusing on, uh, which is, um, my, my, my friend, Mr. Bishop's quote that there is an intentional sabotage of the rule of law. Now, we've heard a couple times today uh, that the GAO and a federal court found that Mr. Wolf was acting unlawfully. To my understanding, that would be a violation of the rule of law. But let's focus a little bit on some policies uh, and some efforts. Mr. Jimenez mentioned uh, that there are children who cannot be found, which brings up, of course, the Trump administration uh, family separation policy. Um, Mr. Wolf, when you were the chief of staff to the Secretary of Homeland Security, isn't it true that you supported the family separation policy? I was at the department uh, from 2017 to, to the end of the administration. Well, did you not, uh, according to an inspector general's report, uh, urge the counselor to the attorney general uh, to implement the family separation policy, to increase prosecution of family unit parents and separate family units? No, I don't believe. That's okay, well, I, I want to introduce into the record this yep. Inspector General's report on family separation, which includes an email by you to Gene Hamilton, the counselor to the Attorney General. So that email had a number of uh, I, Hold on, hold on. Consideration, there was no direction, there was no right. direct... So you're or, saying right here, right now, that you did not support the family separation policy. That was not Is your that question. your testimony? That was not your question. I'm asking it right now. Is that your testimony? We implemented a number of policies in the administration. I agreed with President Trump when he ended zero tolerance in June, June I believe, of 2018. Did you Absolutely. support the family separation policy? Again, we had, no, we had no family separation policy at the department. Really? The department did not? No, I'm happy to go through this. All right, Attorney let's, General let's announced talk about a zero this. tolerance policy that the let's department talk about then this. implemented. Let's, one sec, one sec. Uh, let's talk about this, because the facts are that more than 5,000 children uh, were forcibly separated from their parents at the border. And the reason is because the Department of Justice, for the first time, used Title VIII, United States Code, Section 1325, which makes it a misdemeanor offense to charge anyone crossing without uh, lawful, with, without papers, et cetera. That had never been used before, because the only point of that is to put 
parents who are charged with that in jail where they cannot actually uh, be, be with their families. Now, a federal court in 2018 ended the family separation policy, which this court determined that there was, because the government's policy, quote, shocks the conscience, unquote, and violates the constitutional right to family integrity. There are still children who were separated at the border from their parents who have not been found because this zero tolerance policy, which ultimately ended up separating parents and children, did not create any mechanism to account for that separation in order to track the children. Now, that clearly, as a judge said, was a violation of the rule of law, an intentional sabotage of the rule of law. Let me go quickly to another one. According to a whistleblower complaint by the former head of the department's intelligence branch, Mr. Wolf ordered him to withhold an intelligence notification on Russian activities because it, quote, made the president look bad. The inspector general, the office of inspector general investigated it and found that the department did not adequately follow its internal processes and uh, policy standards when editing and disseminating an intelligence product regarding Russian interference with the 2020 presidential election. And the acting secretary, Mr. Wolf, participated in that review process. I now recognize Mr. Goldman uh, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I'm very happy to follow up on that uh, quite remarkable statement uh, from Mr. Benzman. Let me ask you something, Mr. Benzman. Do you think that the more than 400 mass shootings in this country this year could also be avoided if we had universal background checks, if we did not sell weapons of war to civilians, if we had safe storage laws, if we had common sense gun legislation? Is it your view that every crime that's committed by an American citizen is not avoidable and therefore we should just accept it? Why is it only the crime that happens to be committed by people who are not here somehow that you care so much about and yet all of the devastating crime that is committed by people who are here doesn't matter? because we don't ever talk about gun violence in this committee. We bring up, as my colleague from Rhode Island did, the fact that 500,000 guns are reportedly exported to Mexican cartels, because in Mexico they only have one gun shop that takes months to actually buy a gun, so the cartels cannot actually get the guns from themselves. They get them from the United States of America. They get the uh, weapons of war, the assault weapons from American manufacturers who then funnel them to the cartels so they can control the fentanyl trade, they can control the border smuggling, and they can control and devastate communities both within their country and those trying to get into this country. So if we're really going to talk about border security and we're going to talk about the crime that those who are coming across Let's talk about the crime. The notion that comparisons of crimes committed by those who are here unlawfully and those who are here lawfully is bogus because it's all avoidable is the biggest bunk I've ever heard. Crime is crime. We gotta be preventing crime of all sorts. And people have a right to escape persecution and gang violence and authoritarian governments from their own countries and come to this country to seek refuge in the United States of America as we have been doing forever. And I will add for my colleagues, I come from New York City. In the last year, uh, there have been more than 90,000 migrants who have come to New York City. And I'm not sitting here to cast blame as to how they got there. Uh, I'm only pointing out that they are here. And we are proudly, proudly sheltering them, feeding them, vaccinating them, helping them get on their feet so that they can pursue the American dream as so many of our ancestors did. But do you wanna know something? You talk about crime, 
There has not been a single violent arrest in New York City from any of those more than 90,000 people. Not one. So you find me any other group of 90,000 people and no violent arrests, I challenge you. You can't do it. Because what they want is to come here and work. And what Mr. Beer has been talking about is that those migrants who are coming here to work benefit our economy. And you know why they do? Because we have a workforce shortage. We have businesses who are desperate for labor and they can't get labor. These people, if they were giving the opportunity to work, would become part of our communities, would pay taxes, would boost the economy, would take jobs that Americans are not taking. All of that would help our economy. But instead, we are here focusing on red herrings and completely tangential issues that don't get to the core of the problem. I had a lot of questions to ask, and obviously I have not, but I look forward to a second round um, because I get very frustrated when we're up here grandstanding and we're not actually working to address the real problems that we're facing. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence, and I yield back. This committee has been investigating these allegations for more than eight months. This committee of uh, House Republicans have obtained uh, more than 12,000 documents, pages of bank records, more than 2,000 suspicious activity reports, numerous hours of witness testimony, texts, emails. And the problem they have is not that they can't get the evidence. The problem they have is that the evidence does not support their allegations. And so why are we going to spend the next few months on a bogus and sham impeachment inquiry? Because Donald Trump wants them to. And Donald Trump has been calling them and urging them to do it because he was impeached twice. One of those impeachments of Donald Trump was because he tried to extort the president of Ukraine to investigate Hunter Biden. The president of Ukraine refused. Unfortunately, House Republicans don't have the spine that President Zelensky has, and they are now doing Donald Trump's bidding. Let me move on to the topic today, and I know that my colleagues would like to narrowly focus uh, this hearing on their sudden grave concerns about third-party litigation funding. That's right, my Republican colleagues are having a hearing to criticize and restrict the free market from investing in litigation. Well, how could that possibly be that the party of free markets would want to restrict the free market? Well, I know why. Because big corporations and special interests don't like the fact that independent investors can support litigation that otherwise would not be able to be brought because of the expense. And I also find it ironic that Republicans are criticizing third party funding in legal proceedings when they themselves have engaged in the same kind of third party funding. And I'd like to ask unanimous consent to introduce uh, for the record, an uh, article entitled, FBI Whistleblowers Admit Taking Money from Ex-Trump Official. It's no surprise that the Republicans are doing the bidding of the same special interests who have been spending massive amounts of money, of dark money, to control the Supreme Court. But the odd thing is that we're here talking about the ethical issues of third-party litigation funding and not the ethical issues in the Supreme Court. In June, I led a letter of 18 former prosecutors and law enforcement officials urging the Chief Justice to abide by his own declaration that he would take care of these ethics concerns and saying that if he were to do that appropriately and seriously, he would first have to establish an independent investigative body within the court that can provide transparency and accountability and two, that he would have to establish a dedicated ethics council to provide advice to the justices on their ethical issues. 
Unfortunately, his response to that letter just simply thanked me for writing it. And that's not good enough. And so my time is up, but I would urge my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who ostensibly are concerned with ethics, that they hold a hearing on the dramatic and absurd ethical lapses of Supreme Court justices and make sure that we implement a, the, uh, an ethics code on the Supreme Court, which, is the, which are the only nine justices in our entire federal judiciary who do not have to abide by our ethics code. And I yield back. I have a couple of quotes that I want to read to you, uh, and let me know if you know who said them. Uh, first, quote, migrants get more attention and resources than any other group in the city, and we are just turning New York into the world's refugee camp. Do you know who said that? Well, that sounds like me. It was. Next, quote, they seem to be on the whole an honest class, but they are continually brought before the courts for fighting, violence, and attempts at murder. Crimes which arise from the crowded way in which they live and the jealousies and quarrels that would naturally arrive from such a promiscuous mode of life. But the children as they grow up will naturally and inevitably form the criminal class of this city. Do you know what group of newly arrived immigrants that this quote referred to? I would say uh, 19th century immigrants, Italy, Ireland. Maybe. Italians. It's from an 1882 New York Times editorial about Italian immigrants coming to New York City, which were sadly reflective of a really disgusting common sentiment at the time. And you're a member of New York City Council's Italian Caucus, right? Would you, ag right? Yes, sir. Would you agree with that assessment of Italians as forming the criminal class of New York City? No, sir. And you have been fear-mongering on this issue, as have my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, about the, quote, criminals coming across the border. But you are aware, are you not, Mr. Borelli, that the uh, amount of crime from the migrants who have arrived in New York City is far lower than the average crime rate in the city, correct? I'm unaware of it, but I'll assume since you're saying it in public, uh, it's true. I, I have, I would just- I would just, to... uh, sorry, I don't want to, uh, cut you off, but I have a bunch I want to get through. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that frustrates us on, on this side of the aisle in New York City about some of your rhetoric, and I represent the district that includes the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. My grandmother escaped anti-Semitism to come through Ellis Island, as so many of our uh, forefathers did. The Statue of Liberty states, quote, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And that is the New York way. New York City has always welcomed immigrants. Immigrants are what make that city the most dynamic in the country and have built its success. And we must welcome immigrants that are fleeing horrific conditions in their countries, in Central and South America. And I applaud the Biden administration for announcing a reinvestment into those countries to stabilize them and improve their economies. In your opening statement, you identify a lot of problems that we have, Mr. Borelli, um, very few solutions. But I, I wanna ask you a couple questions about uh, some solutions. You noted one of the uh, migrants has an asylum date of 2033. You would agree that part of the problem that we have are asylum delays, is that right? Expediting court cases would be helpful. And would it be helpful to have more immigration judges to, do, to help expedite that uh, backlog? I assume part of that problem is the lack of judges. Yeah. Um, you've talked about, and we've all talked about, the problem with uh, fentanyl and the cartels. In fact, my colleague from Texas just say that the cartels control the border and control the fentanyl solution. Uh, sort of trade. You would agree, would you not, that if the cartels did not have weapons of war, they would have less control uh, over the border. Is that correct? I, I don't know how they have control in Mexico, but I just met with the Office of uh, Special... So you don't... You do, are you aware that they have a lot of guns? The majority of, of the deaths in my district of drugs uh, are have trace amounts of fentanyl in. Right. So fentanyl's a problem, controlled, as my colleagues say, by the cartels, who have... More, all, as much as 90% of their guns come from America. You would agree more visas 
lawful visas would help, right? More than 50% of Fortune 500 CEOs are either immigrants or children of immigrants. If we had more lawful visas, that would reduce the amount of immigration coming across our border. And then finally, I just want to ask, the business community in New York City, as I'm sure you know, has come out in favor of granting migrants work authorization, right? Do you, do you agree with that? Work authorizations are certainly part of the solution, but it's unclear why we would have to prioritize people for work authorizations who have not followed the law thus far. We don't need to prioritize it, but would you agree that those, would you agree, my last question, sir, would you agree that the 180-day waiting period should be reduced after someone applies for asylum to get a work authorization? I would agree that there are work authorizations that could be granted for the thousands of people that, that you and I both represent who have families waiting overseas, right. who have to date applied and follow over. Exactly. The business, I'm, and I'm just if I could wrap up because my time's almost out, over. And, and that is correct. The business community wants people to work and we want people to work. Every single one of those proposals I just mentioned are democratic legislative proposals. None of them are included in HR2 or any Republican proposals because they're not interested in solving the problem. They're interested in starving our border, starving our Department of Homeland Security so that it continues to fail for their political benefit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This hearing is entitled The Basis for an Impeachment Inquiry. You would think that after eight months of an investigation, we would not need to have a hearing with no witness who has any direct knowledge of the, uh, the evidence to determine that there is a basis for this impeachment inquiry. And this is an impeachment inquiry. Mr. Turley and Mr. Gerhardt testified in 2019 in the official impeachment process in the Judiciary Committee. The inquiry was in the Intelligence Committee. And in the Intelligence Committee, there were 17 firsthand witnesses with direct knowledge of the allegations. And the public hearings had 12 witnesses, all with firsthand. Here we are in our first hearing, no one has any actual knowledge or evidence, there's nothing new here. So why don't we have some of the fact witnesses here? You've brought them in, You've come, they've come in already. What about Devin Archer? Now, Mr. Donalds and the chairman now want to disavow Mr. Archer's testimony that Mr. Biggs entirely relies upon, but they don't want him to come sit here, why? Well, maybe because he testified that Joe Biden never discussed business with Hunter or other business associates, he got nothing from their businesses, and he never took any official acts related to the businesses. Or maybe the American people might hear that this $3.5 million from Batarina actually had nothing to do with Hunter Biden, which is what Devin Archer testified. Or what about Eric Schwerin, Hunter Biden's partner and accountant? He also performed a number of administrative and bookkeeping tasks for then Vice President Biden and Hunter Biden. He saw Vice President, President Biden's bank accounts. And he told the committee that he was not aware of any involvement by President Biden in the financial conduct of his relatives' businesses, much less any transactions into or out of then Vice President's bank account related to business conducted by any family member. And the list goes on. We've already talked about Lev Parnas and Rudy Giuliani. The reason is you bring in the fact witnesses and your case goes down the drain. Now, even yesterday in releasing 700 pages of documents, Chairman Smith admitted that he's not an expert in the timeline, which seems to encapsulate this investigation to a T. Because here we are seeing texts and emails from 2017. We're seeing Department of Justice emails from 2020 when it was the Donald Trump Justice Department. And all we hear all day long, Biden family, Biden family, Biden family. And every time you hear that, you know that it doesn't include Joe Biden. If there were nine Biden family members who got money from these business transactions, isn't it striking that Joe Biden was not one of them? Pretty remarkable. And what we hear is this is an exceedingly complex chain of transactions. That's what the House Republicans said. Pattern of incredible financial complexity. Ms. McLean showed a chart. It had a uh, investor. It had an investment company that invested money, that received money, and then it went to the investors. Mr. Dubinsky, that's not very complicated, is it? 
Well, that's not really the question. The question is, what was going on there? Was there an investment? What's the I'm structure? just asking about the structure. Well, that's because structure. what we well, have here, and we hear so much about services and, and all of this, uh, you know, services are legitimate or product. It's an investment company. It's a private equity company that invests capital in other corporations and companies. That is standard practice. Well, you have said that lying as a, as a president is not impeachable. You have said that there's an influence peddling campaign, but you will acknowledge, will you not, that in order to have a criminal act of public corruption or bribery, there must be under McDonnell an official act in connection to some sort of personal benefit. Isn't that right? Gentlemen's time's expired, but Mr. Charlie, please answer the question. Yeah, I can just point you to my testimony. I talk about quid Just answer the question. Because yeah, it's a little more complicated. No, it's not. An official uh, act for a personal benefit. Uh, Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair now recognizes Ms. Green from Georgia. Mr. Chair, uh, I yield five minutes to my colleague from New York, Mr. Goldman. Thank you very much, Mr. Santos. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of this resolution to expel George Santos from Congress, as I did in May when I co-sponsored a similar expulsion resolution that the sponsors of today's resolution, my colleagues from, uh, my Republican colleagues from New York, did not support. Nothing about the numerous lies that Mr. Santos admitted himself to making in order to deceive his voters into electing him. Nothing about his status as an indicted criminal defendant. Yes, there has been a superseding indictment with more allegations of criminal conduct, but he is still presumed innocent until proven guilty, as my New York friends relied upon in May when they voted to protect George Santos from expulsion. Nothing has changed from the Ethics Committee, even though one of my colleagues from New York said that the Ethics Committee would expedite its investigation and release a report 60 days from the date of that May vote. Well, we are now 175 days since then, and there is no ethics report that would prompt a change of heart. One thing that has changed is that Mr. Santos's campaign treasurer pled guilty to fraud and admitted under oath that she conspired with Mr. Santos to fabricate a non-existent $500,000 loan to his campaign. But the resolution drafted by my friends from New York does not even mention that new fact. You see, I know that the people of New York care about integrity. They care that one of their Republican representatives is a liar and a fraud. They care about the fact that Mr. Santos has done nothing to serve his constituents, yet still provides a loyal and vital vote to the Republican Party. And George Santos hangs like an albatross around the necks of every single Republican from New York. They don't care anymore today about integrity or morality or the reputation of this institution than they did in May when they voted to protect Mr. Santos. They just care about their reelection in one year when they know that their support for George Santos is going to be a problem. Mr. Santos should be expelled from Congress today for the same reasons that he should have been expelled in May. He himself admitted him to numerous lies that he made during the campaign to deceive the voters. He is only walking these halls and voting on this floor because of those lies. And now we have additional testimony that he conspired to commit fraud. Democrats will once again vote to expel someone who should never have had the honor of walking these halls and voting on legislation affecting the American people. The only question is whether Republicans care more about honor and integrity than they do about political power? I hope the answer is yes, but I fear the answer is no. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back. Once again, here we are, days away from a government shutdown. The world is burning. And we're here talking about office space. Office space. Meanwhile, Republicans cannot pass their own <clears throat> unilateral appropriations bills. They refuse to work with Democrats. They refuse to abide by the top line appropriation numbers that they themselves negotiated, agreed to, and passed in June. And separately, they refuse to unify the Congress 
to fund our democratic allies fighting terrorism and authoritarianism around the world. Our democratic ally, Ukraine, resisting an illegal invasion by Vladimir Putin and a brutal and barbaric invasion of Israel by a terrorist organization, Hamas, trying to eradicate Israel, the lone true democracy in the Middle East. Ukraine, Israel, and the innocent Palestinians in Gaza desperately need our help. And yet Republicans are holding that age ho aid hostage with their political gimmicks and games. And here we are talking about office space. Now, in fairness, this is a welcome break from the pathetic and desperate impeachment inquiry. It appears as if the chairman has at least acknowledged that the first and only public impeachment hearing was such a bust that he doesn't want to do it in public anymore because God forbid the American people would once again see what a sham it is. But that has not stopped my colleagues on the other side of the aisle from issuing subpoenas for closed door depositions. That way, they can continue to cherry pick testimony that misleads and gaslights the American people. Look, we know that our colleagues across the aisle are desperate to find some actual evidence of wrongdoing to justify their failed impeachment inquiry. But even under these desperate circumstances, I am still shocked and disappointed that you have targeted someone grieving from the horrific attack of October 7th for your impeachment investigation. Mr. Chairman, this subpoena is beneath the Congress of the United States. And I ask you here and now, will you agree to immediately withdraw the subpoena to Ms. Naftali until a later date when she is not in such emotional distress and can properly focus on this matter? And I yield to you to answer the question. Gentlemen, time's expired, but I will answer the question. We have spoken with uh, her attorney and asked what would be best for her schedule. Uh, as you know, we're trying to get as many of these completed before the end of the year as possible, uh, but they gave us a date in uh, mid to late January, her attorney, and we said that would be fine. So we are catering to her schedule. We will continue this impeachment inquiry. As you know, there's overwhelming evidence that the American people are concerned as to what the Biden family did to receive millions and millions of dollars from our enemies around the world. And we will continue to provide answers to the American people, just as if we, just as we have done uh, over the past six months. Will the chairman yield for one No, second, your time has expired. Chair now I recognizes- I just want to clarify that uh, you said, as you know, I do not know that, nor do I agree with it. Secretary Mayorkas, you were not allowed to answer a number of the questions that uh, my colleague just asked you. I'd like to give you some time to uh, respond if you would like. Uh, Congressman, I would only say this, <clears throat> that um, uh, we do not minimize the, um, the significance of the challenge at the southern border. We also understand the challenge at the southern border and the fact that it is reflective of a challenge that is gripping our entire hemisphere and in fact the world. Yesterday, I spent time uh, with my counterparts from the European Union who spoke of the challenges that they are suffering by reason of a, an historic displacement of people uh, around the world. We work day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week to advance the security of our southwest border, to advance the security of the northern border, and to achieve our highest and most important mission, the safety and security of the American people. Um, I appreciate that, and I also appreciate very much that um, policy disputes are not impeachable offenses. And we can wax poetic and make big political pronouncements about whether you should be impeached or not, um, but impeachment is high crimes and misdemeanors, bribery and treason, uh, a policy dispute and a disagreement about how we are managing the border is not impeachable. But I do want to give you just an opportunity because I know the administration under your leadership has actually taken numerous measures to address what you rightly point out to be a dramatic increase in the influx of uh, immigrants to this country in large part because of the collapsing governments in Central and uh, South America, as well as 
uh, climate disruption. So could you just describe briefly um, some of the measures that, that you have taken to address this influx in uh, immigration at our southern border? Congressman, the, found, the foundational point is the following, and it's a point about which everyone agrees, that we are working with a broken immigration <laughs> system that has been in desperate need of reform for more than 20 years. I believe it's 19, since 1996. Number one, within the confines of that broken immigration system, we are uh, implementing a model that does work, and that is to build safe, lawful, and orderly pathways for individuals to obtain the relief that the law that Congress has passed provides them and to deliver consequences for those individuals who do not avail themselves of those pathways. That is a model that is proven effective in the context of a broken immigration system and also in the context of a phenomenon, the phenomenon of migration of displaced people that is incredibly dynamic and changes month to month. And I appreciate very much your point, which uh, my Republican colleagues do, do not seem to accept, which is that our immigration system can only be fixed by us. It requires legislation passed by Congress that cannot be managed separately and individually by the executive branch. Director Ray, in my short time left, I, I want to focus on a testimony you gave a couple weeks ago uh, noting the tremendous uptick in anti-Semitic hate crimes. I believe you testified that even though Jews make up only 2.4% of the United States population, anti-Semitic hate crimes account for around 60% of all religious-based hate crimes. Uh, and you indicated that this comes from across the spectrum, from the left, from the right, foreign terrorist organizations, homegrown violent extremists, domestic violent extremists. Can you expand a little bit on the, those uh, heightened threats to the Jewish community now two weeks later and how the increase of anti-Semitic hate speech has impacted or affected or increased the threats of violence that the FBI has uh, noticed since October 7th? Well, so a as you said, uh, I have tried to be very clear that one of the things that jumps out at me and which is why we work so closely at the FBI, both nationally and locally with the Jewish community, is that the Jewish community is uniquely targeted by terrorism and hate really across the spectrum. And uh, not that there should ever be a, a proportion for hate, but, uh, but the idea that a group that makes up only 2.4% of the American public should be targeted with something close to 60% of all religiously based uh, hate crime is abhorrent and should be abhorrent to everyone. We have seen uh, over the last few years an increase, not just in hate crimes overall, but an increase, a market increase in anti-Semitic hate crimes. And that's all with the recognition that hate crimes are, as we all know, chronically underreported. And we have had just in the past few years, we've thwarted plots to attack synagogues and. Colorado, Ohio, Nevada. We've made arrests for threats or attacks against the Jewish community in California to Michigan to New Jersey. We helped rescue the hostages in Colleyville. And I could go on and on. And that's all before October 7th. Since October 7th, as I've testified, we've seen an increase in threats and reported uh, threats, uh, which cover this across the spectrum. But the biggest chunk of those, again, by far, is threats to the Jewish community. Uh, and so we are aggressively investigating those threats, but we are also very purposefully and intensely doubling down on our engagement with the Jewish community, which needs our help. And I think it's incumbent on all Americans to stand together on this. I appreciate that. I appreciate the chairman for indulging uh, over time. I would just add that I do hope that the FBI makes a much more concerted effort to pressure local law enforcement agencies to participate in the collection of data on hate crimes, which is woefully deficient. So even that information that you have only, only includes about 21% of law enforcement agencies in the country. And I thank you and yield Gentlemen back. yields. My colleagues and friends from North Carolina and Florida are asking why we are talking about Donald Trump. The answer is because this subcommittee is called the Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government. And because of that, <clears throat> we actually, the only evidence that we have here in front of us today about the weaponization of the Federal Government is from Ms. Troy, 
who has outlined in detail, and I'm sure she has more detail, how Donald Trump weaponized the federal government against his enemies and for his own political interests, and how he intends to do it again. So if we really want to talk about the weaponization of the federal government, we should talk about it, and that's Donald Trump. That's not this grand, crazy conspiracy of how the uh, administration has utilized the social media companies against whom the First Amendment does not apply in order to suppress speech. We, this is actually the second hearing, I guess our quarterly hearing now, on the, the Twitter files with the same uh, witnesses that we had. In the first hearing, um, I asked uh, Chairman Jordan uh, if he could identify any evidence of the government um, under the Biden administration actually censoring um, uh, anyone through the social media companies. He pointed out to me an email um, on January 22nd uh, from Clark Humphrey to flag a tweet that was from Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as evidence. The problem was, and the chairman did not, rec did not acknowledge this, the tweet was never taken down. How can you have censorship if the tweet was not taken down? And since March 9th, that hearing, this committee has had 29 witnesses. With the gentleman you? Uh, I, I will not only just because I have a bunch. You, if you, you're the chairman, so I'm sure you'll respond after me. Um, the 29 witnesses have testified, and every single one testified, that the government never coerced, pressured, or threatened any social media company to remove any content. Mr. Tybee, I introduced a letter um, that I led to X. Um, let's call it X now. That way we can know the difference between when Elon Musk took it over and before uh, when it was Twitter. Um, from November 21st, have you read this? No. Well, <clears throat> do you think it would be problematic if X leaves up terrorist violence and propaganda in violation of the terms of service? Terrorist violence or terrorist prop propaganda? If it violates their terms of service, is it, is it problematic? Well, it depends on what the content is, but, um, you know, they're a private company. They can do what they want with the content. Aha! Mr. Schellenberger, in brief time, you, only, you said that the censorship, the biggest problem you have is the censorship that you talk about is election interference. Do you agree that Russia used social media, including Twitter, to interfere in the 2016 presidential election? Yes. Thank you. Now, we've also briefly, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just have a, the extra time that my colleagues have had. Um, you've talked about the Hunter Biden laptop and how the FBI knew it existed. You are aware, of course, that the uh, laptop, so to speak, was actually, that was published in the New York Post, was actually a hard drive that the New York Post admitted here was not authenticated as real. It was not the laptop the FBI had. You're aware of that, right? It was the same contents. How do you know? Because, because it's the same, I mean, it's You would have to authenticate it to know it was the, the same, same contents. contents. You have no idea. You know you hard drives can be manipulated. Are you suggesting the New York Post participating in a conspiracy to construct the contents of the Hunter Biden laptop? No, sir. The problem is that hard drives can be manipulated by Rudy Giuliani or Russia. But what's the evidence that and that happened? What's well, the there is actual evidence of it, but the point is it's There's not no the evidence same thing. So you're engaging in a conspiracy theory. I'm glad theory. you agree with me, Mr. Schellenberger, that transparency is the most important thing. And my last question for you is do you think it would be transparent if Hunter Biden came to this Congress and testified in a public hearing and more transparent than if he testified privately? It's, I mean, literally, I've never thought about that. I have no idea. <laughs> you don't I've know? literally never thought about is that. public the testimony time, more I mean, transparent than private testimony? Hour. Are you familiar with the First Mr. Amendment? Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The Congress shall take no action it, it, to abridge freedom of speech. Yeah. And, and that's what you just described. Mr. Schellenberger, is 13% censorship still censorship? Absolutely. And the other 87% is what we call the chilling effect that the courts have long recognized that they engaged in. You have that to, is the problem. There's a broad, op by the way, part of the operation, Congressman Holy Goldman, cow. part of the operation was to change the terms of service. So you see them constantly trying to change the terms of service 
you see them, it was 35% of, of the URLs that were, this according to EIP, were labeled, removed, or soft blocked. That's all forms of censorship. That censorship is not just removal. But 65% were not. So how can the government be so, so coercive? So does the First Amendment say that's about the government par for the course on government does efficiency? Does the First Amendment say the government can censor the time of the deadline has expired. They're not censoring. They're flagging in the social media companies. So under coercion, 35% of a First Chair, Amendment? Or? Chair it's not the First Amendment. It's the terms of service, as you said, and they are flagging it for the social media companies to make their own decisions. <laughs> that is not the First Amendment. That is the terms of service. We have well, just seen them. Congressman, you're an attorney. You know that the four federal judges have already ruled that and I know that it's on appeal in front of the Supreme Court right now okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, this that debate was very constructive. Ooh, that was I fun. think that got to the heart of the issue that's that's the problem right there that's, the that, gentlelady that's from right. Wyoming is recognized for five minutes whatever complaints that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have about how the Department of Justice investigated a private citizen Hunter Biden you should ask Donald Trump and Bill Barr who were in power at the time that this investigation was going on. So because there's no evidence, now we're gonna move the goalposts, claiming an impeachment inquiry is necessary to gather more evidence. But Chairman Comer himself said earlier this year that he had received 100% compliance from the administration. And they can only cite to two low-level career officials at the Department of Justice who uh, have not testified, even though their supervisors have. Just this morning, Hunter Biden showed up to the Capitol ready to provide evidence. The Republicans refused to take his testimony. So how can you sit there saying you need more evidence when you prevent the central witness in the investigation from giving you evidence? What are you afraid of? I yield back.